jumping into our third week today of our 2018 Christmas series that we are calling Whoville. Whoville. Now, most of us are familiar with the central figures in Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch Stole Christmas. We know about the bitter green elf or the bitter green Grinch who hides, isolates himself in his cave up at the top of Mount Crumpet. And we know about his neighbors, the Who's, that live in the aptly named Whoville. And they celebrate Christmas. They love Christmas. I mean, they blow the doors off of Christmas. And the Grinch just hates their celebration of it because he hates Christmas. We remember maybe the Grinch's puppy dog, Max, who pulls the Grinch's sleigh from Who House to Who House on Christmas Eve as the Grinch, disguised as Santa Claus, sneaks into every Who House and steals all of their Christmas decorations and presents and everything else. And then, of course, there's the cutie pie, there's Cindy Lou Who, the, the little girl who wakes up Christmas Eve about 2, 3 in the morning and finds the Grinch shoving their family's Christmas tree up the chimney. But we're not so sure, though, about the rest of the Who's in the Christmas story. I mean, who are they, all these other Who's, and what role do they play in the story? If we were to kind of interview one of them or zoom in on their life, their story, what might we learn about the Christmas story, how the Grinch stole Christmas? Well, this whole series has been about asking those same types of questions about the Christmas story we find in the Bible in Luke chapter 2. Because we've got some central historical figures in this Christmas story too that stand out during the birth of God's son. People like Mary, God's God's mother, the the young junior high age girl that would give birth to the Son of God. People like Joseph, the guy who swung a hammer for a living, who she was betrothed to, who would help raise Jesus and be that father figure, that earthly father figure in his life. And then, of course, the main character of the story, Jesus, the baby, the Savior himself. But who else gets to be there? Who else gets to share in that joy in this story? Well, in week one, we talked about an angel that got to deliver the best news. His name was Gabriel. And he got to deliver the news to Mary that she was going to conceive and give birth to God's son. And then last week, week two, Pastor Zach walked us through the Whoville in our Christmas story, Bethlehem, and talked with us about how central Bethlehem is to the whole Christmas story we find in Scripture. Now today, today we're going to zoom in, we're going to talk about a group of guys who spend most of their time with animals, sheep to be specific. And I really hope you don't mind the smell. I mean, these guys really don't think too much about bathing. They really don't have the time to, actually. But I think if we can really look at, look at these guys, if we can see past their grimy, calloused hands, if we can look deeper than their bearded, weather-worn faces, these these shepherds, if we can really look at their experience and who they really are, I believe we will find out something very important about Jesus and who he came for. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Okay, so somehow we've got to get these shepherds, these guys, our boys, we've got to get them from where they are in this field to Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus. But how to do it? That's the question. I mean, maybe God could give them a dream, right? God's spoken to people in dreams before. Like maybe one of them could just conk out for a few minutes. Like have you ever done that? Maybe when you were in study hall in school, you nod off for a minute, maybe in your cubicle at work. Maybe during a sermon, right? We've all done it. Maybe one of those guys could just kind of nod off for a minute. God gives him a dream, like, snaps awake, right? And he's like, oh my gosh, guys, God gave me a dream. Get your stuff, we gotta go. Forget about the sheep. They'll be fine for a minute. We gotta go. Maybe a dream. No, not, not, not big enough, right? How about a prophet? God's spoken to his people through prophets lots of times, right? We could get like a a Gandalf-looking guy with a really gnarly beard. Maybe he kind of wanders into the shepherd's camp and you see him reflected in the, the firelight. Lo, brothers, a baby's been born this way, right? Maybe a prophet. 
Maybe not. Not a dream. Not a prophet. No, the God of the universe goes all out and he sends a very special messenger. He sends an angel to deliver this news. Verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. They're scared. The Bible says terrified. I mean, these, these shepherds aren't singing, oh, holy night. These shepherds are thinking, oh, holy crap, right? I mean, they're freaking out. Now, what you have here in Scripture is you have what I would call a jump. A jump is what happens when you all of a sudden see something that's it's really not supposed to be there, right? Like, say you're in a movie theater. And you're watching the trailers that, that come before the movie start, the preview of these upcoming movies, then all of a sudden it comes on. The trailer for the brand new freaky thriller that you've been waiting for. And you just know this movie's going to scare you, right? And it, the, the camera pans in on this house. It's dark. It's nighttime. And it shows this young married couple that getting ready to call it a night. And then all of a sudden it zooms in and the wife, she's in the bathroom and it's one of those kind of over-the-shoulder mirror shots and she leans down into the sink to wash her face. Then she comes back up and there's like this undead zombie chick standing over her shoulder kind of popping, right? And it freaks her out and it freaks you out. I'm telling you, in verse 9 says that they were terrified. We are talking about like intense spookification here, okay? That's not a word. It's not a word. Add it to the Sean Harris Velocity lexicon, right? My point is that when we imagine this story, when we recreate this story, when we send our children to the church Christmas play dressed up in bathrobes as the shepherds, we, we completely lose the power and the trauma of what's happening here. I mean, this angel basically has to talk these guys down. This angel basically has to say, Ch chill out, guys. I didn't come to kill you. I didn't come to chase you. I didn't come to haunt you. I came to give you some really, really good news. Check it out. Verse 10. The angel said to them, the shepherds, don't be afraid. Guys, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of of David. Now, the town of David, as Zach talked about last week, the town of David is Bethlehem. Again, it was prophesied for hundreds of years before Jesus was born that the Savior, the Messiah, the Rescuer, would come from the Davidic line, the kingly line of David. And Bethlehem was also prophesied about as being David's hometown and that the Savior would come born in Bethlehem. Verse 11, today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. So the angel gives us three descriptors, describes Jesus in three ways. Jesus is the savior, he's the Messiah, and he's the Lord. But what do those mean? So easy to gloss over that language if you hear it enough. Well, by saying Jesus is savior, this means that Jesus is our rescuer. He's come to rescue us. Well, rescue us from what? Well, rescue us from sin? Rescue us from shame? Rescue us from brokenness? Rescue us from lies? Rescue us from death? Yeah, we need a rescuer. Jesus is the Messiah. Messiah comes from the Hebrew word mashiach. It means anointed one. Jesus is the anointed one, the one with the anointing. Now, in our culture, when we get like a new president, we have an inauguration, right? Well, the Jews don't roll like that. They didn't have inaugurations. They had an anointing. And they had anointings for three very specific offices. They had anointings for prophets, for the high priest, and for the king. And this is how it would go down. The high priest would take oil, and this was very, very special oil. This was called myrrh. It was made for the comifera, from the comifera myrrh tree, which is indigenous to Central Africa and the Middle East. And they would take this, this sappy stuff, they would melt it down into the oil, they would add cinnamon and a bunch of other spices. It smells like happy. It's amazing. And then they would take that person who was to be anointed, and they would dribble or pour this over their head. To anoint someone was to set them apart as holy, specifically set apart for God's purpose. That's what anointing meant. So Jesus being called the Messiah means that he is the one, the one, who would come 
specifically for God's purpose, the one who all of creation have been waiting for. Jesus is our rescuer. He is the chosen one. And the third way the angel describes him, he is the Lord. He is the Lord. Lord means master. By calling Jesus Lord means that you are saying that Jesus is the boss in every area of your life and over every area of your life. Jesus is our rescuer, he is the chosen one, and he is the Lord. Now here's where things get really interesting. See, the angel gives some direction to these shepherds, to our guys. The angel says, and I really want you to zero in on this again, something from the Christmas story in Luke 2, many of us have heard many times before. But listen, this will be assigned to you, verse 12, you will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. This changes everything for the shepherds for two reasons. Number one, instead of just hearing about all this stuff that's going on over here with the Messiah, with the Savior, all of a sudden now they get an invite. They get a personal invite. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. They're invited. They're going to be like, like the welcoming committee. All of a sudden, they go from hearing to being invited, and now they get to share in the joy and the majesty and the wonder with Mary and Joseph to go and welcome the rescuer, the chosen one, the Lord, the Messiah. Their people have been waiting for, for generations. He's here. Something else I really want to point you at this morning that I think will totally change your understanding of the Christmas story and at very least the shepherd's place in the Christmas story. Notice that the Bible is very, very specific. As the angel says, again, verse 12, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. Now, whenever the Bible mentions a sign, that should stand out. Because a sign in Scripture is something that always points to a deeper truth about who God is. Okay, that's great, Sean, but what does a baby wrapped in claws lying in a manger have to teach me about God? To understand that, we have to pick up some background information, some context from another ancient Jewish work, okay? It's called the Mishnah. Everybody say Mishnah. Mishnah, okay? The Mishnah is basically like the color commentary for the first five books of the Old Testament. Those books are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They're called Torah or the law. Torah means law. And they were given by God to Moses at the top of Mount Sinai in the Old Testament. Okay? Now, when Moses got those, legend tells us, history tells us that Moses had the law, he had Torah, and then he spoke the day-to-day, boots-on-the-ground application of Torah to the Jewish people's lives. Here's the law from God. Here's Torah. Here's Mishnah. Here's how we live this out. That's the Mishnah. It was passed down from Moses to patriarch to patriarch to patriarch, and then in A.D. 200, it said that somebody wrote it down. And practicing Jews study this very intently to this day, the Mishnah. Well, the Mishnah tells us that in the region known as Bethlehem, there was a place called Migdal Eder. Migdal Eder. That's the Hebrew. In English, it means the tower of the flock. Flock being a a group of sheep. The tower of the flock. Now, according to the Mishnah and to secular archaeology, the remains of this are still there. You can visit it today. It was an actual stone tower. Originally in, in, in Israel's history, it was used for fortification or for defense. They would use it as a lookout tower for enemies. Eventually, it came to be used for two very different, very specific purposes. Number one, it was used as a watchtower where our shepherd friends would keep watch over their flocks. And they would watch out for things like predators, right, wolves, would-be sheep nappers, right, Things like that. The second thing is Migdal Eder, the tower of the flock, was also the birthing place for the lambs, the baby sheep, that would eventually be used as sacrifices in the temple. And the sacrifices that these lambs were used for was called an atoning sacrifice. Atonement means to cover over. So these lambs, the blood from these lambs, was considered a sacrifice that would cover over sin. 
So it's very possible, actually, forget that, it's likely. The more I study this, the more I'm convinced that these shepherds, our boys here, these are the shepherds from Migdal Eder, the tower of the flock, who raised sheep very specifically to be sacrificed at the temple for the atonement of sin. Now, according to the Mishnah, our shepherd friends would have been very specifically trained for this job by rabbis. They would have been trained that whenever a you, a mama lamb or mama sheep, was about to give birth, they would take her into that ground floor of the tower of the flock. And that once she had given birth to a lamb, these shepherds knew exactly what they were looking for. They knew how to inspect the lamb. And what they were looking for, according to the Old Testament, was a spotless, blemish-free, perfect lamb to be used as sacrifice. It had to be. No scrapes, no scratches or scars. Perfect, healthy, whole, ritually squeaky clean, this lamb had to be. So once a shepherd identified a newborn lamb as being perfect for sacrifice without defect, listen to me, they would take that lamb, they would wrap it in swaddling clothes, and then they would place that lamb in a manger. Now where have we heard that before? They did this for a couple reasons. They did this so that the lamb could gain its strength without thrashing around, walking around on wobbly legs and hurting itself, blemishing itself, rendering it no longer good for sacrifice. Now let's tie all of this together. Our boys, the shepherds, would not have only instantly understood the sign given to them by the angel, but they would have known exactly where to go to find Jesus. And even deeper than that, these guys, these shepherds of Migdal Eder, were taught very young that the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord, would first be announced at Migdal Eder, at the Tower of the Flock. And this prophecy that talked about this was given, was spoken over 700 years before Jesus was born. A prophet named Micah called it. Check it out, Old Testament, book of Micah, chapter 4, verse 8. He says this again, 700 years before that first Christmas Eve. As for you, watchtower of the flock, there's Migdal Eder, stronghold of daughter Zion. That stronghold refers to it as being that stronghold, that tower of fortification. The former dominion will be restored to you, kingship. Kingship, there's the reference to the Davidic line, to the Messiah. Any first century Jew reading this would know exactly what that meant. Kingship will come to daughter Jerusalem. Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, was not born in a stable as a last resort. He was born in a stable and placed in a manger to fulfill prophecy and to be a sign for these shepherds and for you and for me today. Listen to me. Jesus was born in the same birthplace of thousands of sacrificial lambs that were born specifically to die to atone for sin. The presence of the shepherds at Migdal Eder screams, silently screams to us that Jesus was born to die for our sin and our shame and our brokenness. That the little baby who was placed to sleep in this rough this rough-hewn manger would one day be crucified on a rough-hewn cross. That this little baby boy who was wrapped in swaddling cloth would one day, after being crucified, executed on a Roman cross, would one day be wrapped in burial cloths and placed in a tomb. The angel's invitation to the shepherds at Migdal Eder about Jesus' birth would one day remind us that Jesus was the last the perfect, the once for all sacrifice for our sin. He was the spotless lamb of God. See, the lambs our boys, the shepherds raised, like I said, they were only an atonement for sin. They could only cover sin for a period of time. That's why their business was booming. The temple sacrificed one lamb in the morning and one in the evening, two lambs. And then on special days like Passover, Every Jewish family sacrificed a lamb to cover sin. Jesus' death on the cross didn't just atone for sin. It takes it away. 
completely takes it away. He was the perfect sacrificial lamb of God. Look at scripture, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For you know, you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. Look at verse 19. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. We can learn a lot from the invitation of these shepherds to the birth of Messiah. There's nothing more powerful perhaps, than the right invitation given at the right time. I mean, we can see that even in our story, how the Grinch stole Christmas. In the end, it was that invitation from Cindy Lou to come and share in the Christmas celebration that kind of sealed that relationship, right? I'll never forget my invitation, the one I received from Ken and Lil Kinder. I was 16 years old. I was playing basketball in the backyard with their son, Jeff. I'll never forget it. Ken and Lil did what none of my other friends' parents were doing at that time. They invited me into their home. I was not the kid you wanted in your house. They invited me into their home the first time they met me to sit down at their table and have dinner. And then all they did after that was love me, listen to me, ask me how I was and how school was going and how life at home was going and really listen to me. It was that invitation that God used to lead me to another and another, and it was about a year after that that I would finally understand for the very first time the most amazing invitation that God gives to all of us in John chapter three. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That, and then there's that word, that completely transformed my life. Whoever. Whoever. Any nobody. Whoever believes in him. Not going to perish. You're not going to die. Sin's not going to have the final say over your life. But she'll have eternal life. Whoever. Whoever. There is a Christmas invitation list with your name on it. I mean, that's really what Christmas is all about, isn't it? I mean, we give gifts because he gave the greatest gift, his life, as a ransom, as a payment, as a substitution for yours and for mine. The shepherds, they dropped everything and responded to the invitation. Everything. Everything. But if we get caught up in all the other stuff, and it's so easy to get caught up in all the other stuff at Christmas, isn't it? If we get caught up in all that other stuff and we miss the main who of the Christmas story, Jesus, then we miss Christmas. We miss Christmas. We're like the crowds in Bethlehem in that surrounding area who heard the good news And they never did anything. They never went and visited the Savior. Too busy with the census, too busy with taxes, too busy trying to make ends meet, too busy worrying about what friends and family might think, too busy doing what they wanted to do to take the short trip to to see this Messiah, this Savior. And they absolutely missed Christmas. The most important event of their life up to that point. They missed it. Listen, don't miss the most significant event of your life. Don't miss the invitation. The invitation that says you're invited to come and see the Savior. You're invited to put your trust in him, to believe that he was who he said he was, God's son, and that he could, in fact, do what he said he came to do which was to take away our sin, our shame, and our brokenness, that invitation. Don't miss it. Nothing else matters more than that. Let's pray.
Father, thank you so much for your word for the Bible. I thank you that it speaks new life every week. Father, that even after studying it, someone for their whole life, they can continue to go back to the scripture and just be fed and empowered and renewed and convicted and changed. God, this Christmas, for anyone within the sound of my voice who feels far from you, maybe they were part of a church where they were burned by you. Maybe they just always have struggled with belief. Father, I pray that they would take you up on that invitation and they would come and they would kneel down by the side of the manger and they would peek and they would see the one who came to love, rescue, and save them. And Father, for those who do believe or are somewhere on that spectrum of belief, I pray that this Christmas they would be very intentional about taking a step toward Jesus that their faith and their belief would be made stronger as they go into a world who desperately needs your light and that they would shine it, they would reflect your light to any and all who would see it. Father, we love you and we praise you to that end. It's in Jesus' name, through the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray this day. Amen.